Christ is risen. risen And I am so glad we have our class and um, our fellowship groups because it's a great way to connect with one another, get to know one another, pray with one another, Paul, and and watch football together. And I wore my OSU shirt because I still feel loyal to OSU. We are, we are used to, OSU fans are used to that treatment that we received last night. <laughs> we expect nothing other, nothing else other than that. And when we do win, we are so happy. And uh, <clears throat> so we have many things to be thankful for. We are finishing up, maybe today, the woman in the basket that is introduced to us in Zachariah. And we... Um, are going to see her again, this woman in the basket, in Revelation, the book of Revelation. So, he, so Zechariah is somewhat introducing us to the book of Revelation. So if you would, open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 5. This is the seventh vision of the eight night visions that Zechariah had, probably in one night. And he sees this woman... And on your newsletter, you'll see a portion of that passage, so you should be able to fill in those blanks, I think, pretty well. And so let's read now Zechariah chapter 5, and we read it last week, but we're going to read it one more time, so if you weren't here last week, you can get the idea. The first part of Zechariah 5 was the uh, flying scroll. And the flying scroll represented the word of God and the judgment of those people and those nations who do not obey the word of God. There will be judgment. And today, according to the scriptures, today is the day of salvation. But there will come a day of judgment. And we need to make sure that we're ready for that time. The book of the second vision in chapter 5 is the vision of the woman in the basket and where God removes sin from his nation of Judah. So let's look at that. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, Look up and see what is appearing. And I asked, what is it? And he replied, it is a measuring basket. Now this measuring basket was a small basket. It couldn't hold a woman, but that's the vision of this. Of this. And the basket represented commercialization and, and the evil that will go with commercialization that puts money and the love of money before God. And we're going to see how God feels about that. And commercialization is equated with social injustice. We're going to see what God says about that. And he says, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat what? A woman. And remember when we read in visions about a woman, it generally represents wickedness. This, and he said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed his lead cover down on it. Then I looked up, and there before me were two more women. And these women had wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. And they took it and flew east. They were in Judah. And they took this basket and flew east. Where were they going to take this basket? To Babylon. The scriptures call it Shinar, which is the Hebrew name for Babylon. And I said, where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. And he replied, to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. And when the house is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. And this is the vision. So if you would look at last week's lesson, 
page 72, we, we see the conclusion of the flying scroll that individual sins and sinners will be judged. <clears throat> and then he's wanting us to know that the woman in a basket is wickedness and it will be removed from the land. Jesus Christ cannot come back and set up his kingdom on earth if sin has not been judged and if sin has not been removed from the land. And that is when he will set up his kingdom when that has happened. So the symbolism of this vision, the woman, wickedness is personified by this woman. And she is depicted as a prostitute. Now when we get into Revelation 17, how many of you read my text this week telling you to read Revelation 17 and 18? It really does make it more interesting and much easier to understand when you understand the Old Testament. You will never understand the New Testament unless you know the Old Testament. So it's very important. So the woman is depicted as a prostitute. The basket represents trade and commerce and the evil that accompanies it. Commerce is not wrong in and of itself, but when it come, becomes the passion and the first love of the people in that business, it becomes a sin. And then the lead cover is kept over the basket to keep the woman, to keep the wickedness in the basket. And finally, the winged women take the basket of wickedness east to Babylon, also called what? Shinar. So here's Jerusalem. And you see how they fly up into the heavens and down to Babylon, going back east. Now that's the vision. And Babylon symbolizes, this is so important, when we read in the Bible about Babylon, it's just not the nation of Babylon or the city of Babylon, but it always is symbolic of wickedness and enmity against God. Because the first time we learn about Babylon in the scriptures is in Genesis 11. And we're going to read that in just a moment. And it was the first city that really started to worship other gods, not just not just a few gods, but many gods. So Babylon in the scriptures represents enmity and hate against God. It represents uh, their rebellion against God in worshiping other gods. So when we read about Babylon, that's what it represents. Enmity and hate against God. And so that, we'll read about that in Revelation 17 and 18. So now let me ask you a question. If we were looking at a map today and I said point out Babylon, where would you go to find ancient Babylon today? Stephanie, your hand up. Where would you go? Iran. Not, not Iran. Iraq. 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 Baghdad. Baghdad is a little bit north of Baghdad. Uh, Iran is Persia. So when we study the Bible and we meet King Cyrus, he was from Persia, which is Iran today. And Babylon is in Iraq. And so in the Old Testament, we have Nineveh up here. Who went to Nineveh in the Old Testament? Jonah. 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 And it was the capital of the wicked, wicked, wicked nation of Assyria, the most violent, vicious, inhumane nation. And that's why he didn't want to go to, go to Nineveh. He wanted Nineveh destroyed. He sure didn't want them re, re, um, repenting and turning to God. He wanted it destroyed. Now today, if you want to go to Nineveh, you go to the city of Mosul. In Nineveh, and you will read about Mosul many, many times in the newspaper in, 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 ba in Iraq. And it's on uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Then you come on down south, and here's Baghdad, right here. And then right here we have Babylon. So Baghdad's just a little bit north of Babylon. In fact, ancient Babylon, you can't really 
get to ancient Babylon because the rivers have changed their, their borders and their banks. And so I think it's in the, one of the, in the Euphrates River now because the rivers move, don't they? And down here we will see, uh, no, it's not, okay, this is just, this is the contemporary map. Down here you'll find in the Bible maps a place called Ur, U-R. And that was in Babylon as well. Who, who lived in Babylon, in Ur, in the Bible? Abraham. Abraham. <coughs> Abraham lived in Ur. And God said, I want you to leave Ur. Get out. Because he wanted his people not to live among evil. He still doesn't want people to live in an evil place. In fact, you will read in Jeremiah, in uh, uh, Revelation 18, he says, my people leave Babylon. So we are not to live amongst ungodliness. Our homes should be godly. And he wants us to remove ourselves from those places. The history of Babylon. Let's just look at it real quickly. And I'm not going to go back and read all these verses. I'll never get through if I do. But I would really like for you to go back this week and study the history of Babylon. But just for fun, go over to Genesis 11. Genesis 10 is the first mention of Babylon. Now, in Genesis 8, God destroyed the earth with a big flood. And the man on the ark was named Noah. Noah. And he had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Shem. Now, we're going to meet one of his sons here in Genesis 10. <clears throat> And this is a grandson of his, and his name is Nimrod. Don't name your doggies Nimrod, okay? Because he wasn't a good man. In fact, you will find that he was um, the son of Cush, who was the son of Ham, one of the sons of Noah. And uh, the Hamites, the sons of Ham, founded the, were the people who lived in Assyria and Babylon that we just showed you here on the map. So look at chapter 10, verse 8. Cush was the father of Nimrod. So underline Nimrod, because that name means rebel. Now, we could name our dog Rebel, couldn't we, Lyndon? Because he, he doesn't obey. I don't, I don't know what happened to him but I raised him. Lyndon says, your dog doesn't obey. And I said, well, it's, I, sound like a, I sound terrible. I said, it's not like he's got to grow up and make a living, you know. He doesn't. I'll just feed him and he's sweet. But Nimrod was not a good guy. He, his, his name means rebel. And he was the grandson of Noah. It says in verse 8 that he grew up to be a mighty warrior on the earth. So he was the one who fought other men. He was a great warrior, a mighty warrior. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now those scriptures are implying that when we think of hunters like where is Jerry and Kirk, these guys are out shooting little baby deer, but that's okay. Yeah. That's where they weren't last. They were there last week and not here. What? 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 Somebody say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nimrod was a hunter of men. That's the. That's the implication. In the Hebrew, he was a hunter of men. He was uh, he was the one who founded huge empires, but these empires were violent. And the first one that he founded was Babylon, and he founded Assyria, and both very violent nations. His name means rebel. He was a ruthless warrior and a hunter of men, and he founded the empires of Babylon 
and Assyria. So let's look at page 73. And so we, I want you to understand that Babylon, which stands for the enmity and hate against God, was founded by a man named Rebel. And he was a warrior of men. And so on page 73, Roman numeral 2, Babylon symbols Symbolizes the world's what against God? Enmity. Enmity. So really underline that or circle that. That means hate, defiance, rebellion against God. We don't want that to be us. Letter A, wickedness in the Bible is associated with Babylon. Number one, Genesis 10, 8 through 11. Babylon is first mentioned as a part of of whose empire? Nimrod. Nimrod. What's his name mean? Rebel. rebel. That's letter A. His name means rebel. He was a mighty warrior and hunter, not against deer, but against whom? Men. Men. That's right. And he founded the empires of Babylon and Assyria. And if you look at the rest of those verses, you'll see other places that he founded as well. So that is the first thing that the Bible teaches us about Babylon, that it was founded by a man who was a, a warrior of men and a hunter of men, wanted to defeat men. And he's just the grandson of Noah. Look how quickly wickedness overtook the world again, just so quickly. Now the second time that we read about Babylon is in Genesis 11. And this is when the men and the women of Babylon, can we have the lights please? When the men and women of Babylon began to grow mighty in these empires and they began to understand that, hey, we don't have to obey this God. We don't have to obey God. In fact, we are so smart we can build a tower all the way up to heaven. And so they began to build this tower. What's this tower called? Tower the Tower of Babel. That was built in Babylon. That's maybe where we get the word Babylon. And so God looked down and he saw these people building this mighty tower. He didn't destroy the tower. What did he do? He confused the languages. In fact, that's what Babel means, is confusion. So look at chapter 11. We can turn the lights on, Cindy. Thank you, darling. Uh, verse, um, verse 4. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to what? To the heavens. This is verse 4 of chapter 11 of Genesis so that we may make a name for whom? Ourselves. And we will not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That statement right there is a rebellion against God because he told Shem, Ham, and Japheth to go throughout the world and repopulate it. They said, we're not going to do that. We want to stay here. So it's a, it's a rebellion against God. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And the Lord scattered them over all the earth and they stopped building the city, and that is why they called it Babel. You can go to Babylon today, into that area, and you will see, this is called a ziggurat. You can see ancient ziggurats still there from ancient Babylon. You can still see them. And uh, uh, Saddam Hussein remodeled, tried to rebuild it, and so uh, you'll still see it today. In Babylon, they built this tower to exalt man, didn't they? And what did they try to do to God? Dethrone him. 
They wanted to take God from his throne in heaven and exalt man to that throne. God said, there are several things I hate. There are six things I hate. Then he says, no, there are what? Seven. Seven. Number one is pride. Number one thing God hates is pride because that's rebellion against him. That is defying him. That's exalting ourselves above him. So that's what dethrones God and exalts man. So look at page 73, number 2. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the famous what? Tower of Babel. Have you heard on the, do you hear on the radio? Sometimes they'll be talking about these languages, language lessons that you can learn. What's it called? Babel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Tower of Babel um, was built where? In Babylon to do what with man? Exalt man and dethrone God. All right. Now, we meet Babylon again in chapters 11 and 12 when we are introduced to a man named Abram. He was a man of God. He had faith in that God that all the other people in Babylon were dethroning. He loved God. And God said to him, come out of what? Babylon. He said, he didn't really call it Babylon. He said, come out. He said, I'm going to lead you to a place I want you to be. And that is in chapters 11 and 12. So look at that. Let's see. Chapter 12, verse 1. Abraham is called Abram here. God later changed his name to Abraham. And God comes to him and says, Abram, leave your country. His country was the Ur of the Chaldees, which is another name for Ur of Babylon. I want you to leave that. And your father's household. And where was he to go? Look at verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. He said, I want you to leave your homeland and go where? To the land I have shown you. Thank you, darling. You've never done that to me. We're going to sell our house and we're going to go somewhere. <laughs> but that's what happened, you know? I mean, what, what faith he had that he would pack up his family and go, not knowing where he was going. But God took him to what is called today, that time, the promised land into Canaan. And so Abraham did that. And he said, look at the promises that God gave to Abraham. He said, I will make you into a great nation. Did he do that? What great nation did he make Abram into? Israel. Because his grandson was named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And God changed his name to what? Israel. He said, I will bless you. Did he do that? Yes. God blessed Abram beautifully. Gave him a son when he was a hundred years old. And his wife was 90. It was totally impossible. You know what Romans, I've been reading Romans this week. You know what Romans says about Abraham? It's one of my favorite verses. It said, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God being fully uh, aware that what God promised, fully convinced that what God promised, he was able also to perform. That's, that should be our, our verse every day, that we don't stagger at the promises of God, but we are to be fully convinced that what God's promised, he's also able to perform. And he will. He will perform it. And so he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Did God keep that promise to him? Yes. Look, we're still talking about Abraham 4,000 <laughs> years later. Now that's quite a promise, isn't it? Quite a promise. 4,000 years. He was not only the father of Israel, the Jews. He's the father of the Arabs. And he's our spiritual father. Whoa, what a guy. 
that was the promise that nobody could have ever seen how God was going to fulfill that. And he didn't stagger at it, and God made it even greater than what he even could have thought or even imagined. He said, you will be a blessing. Is Abraham a blessing? Absolutely, because it's through him that we have the Messiah. What a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. This is something we need to be so aware of because God tells every nation and every person, you bless my people and I will do what? Bless you. So we want our leaders of our nation to be a supporter of Israel because of nothing else, this verse. Because look what he says if we curse his people. Look what he says. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That's a promise. And it will happen even a greater in the end times. It will happen. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Are we blessed because of Abraham? Absolutely. We have the Messiah that came from Abraham. And so God kept those promises. And it took, and it's still being fulfilled today, 4,000 years later. So that's, we have a big God. This is the Abraham that came out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And so let's just look at that. Can you see it, Cindy? All right. This is... Um, the map, here's Jerusalem, and here is Ur of the Chaldees down in Babylon, right here. So Abraham uh, left Babylon, or Ur, and look how he went to where God took him. He went north. He followed the Euphrates River. Here's the Tigris. Here's the Euphrates. This is called, in world history, all of you students who study world history, this is called the Fertile Crescent. Look how it's like a crescent row. Those two rivers make a crescent, very fertile, all the way down into Jerusalem. He followed this route of the rivers up north, and then God, he stayed there a while, and then God led him on down into Palestine and what we call today Israel. Why didn't he just go straight west? Wouldn't you think God would have led him in a shorter route going straight west from the Chaldees over to Jerusalem? Do what? Too hot. Too hot. What's over there? What is this in here? Desert. Dreadful, dreadful desert. So God didn't lead him across the desert. He led him by the rivers all the way north and then back down south. This is the same picture of Abraham being called. Here's the, here is the uh, ziggurat or the Tower of Babel today. There's the picture of it, and it just goes up and down like that. That's Abraham's journey. So let me review now the history of Babylon that God says, I'm taking this basket of wickedness to Babylon. First of all, we meet it through what man? What was that man's name? Means rebel. Nimrod. Named me. And he was a hunter of men, a warrior, and he founded these empires. Then we meet those people in Babylon who uh, are the, the, it's the enmity and the hate against God. They represent that, Babylon does. And where we see the Tower of Babel being built. And finally we meet Abram. God calls him out of of Babylon. And uh, this is a prophet. It's kind of hard to see that. But a prophet, by the way, is, um, is the one who receives messages from God and he gives them to the people. Okay? That's what a prophet does. A priest represents people to God, but a prophet represents God to the people. And so we have many prophets in the Old Testament, they received their messages from God. There are four, I think, I have to think about it, major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And those four major prophets, every one of them, 
speak of Babylon. And it is God's judgment against Babylon. Jeremiah 50 and 51. Now that you know about Babylon, go read it because it tells you how God is going to judge Babylon. Ezekiel talks about Babylon. Isaiah talks about God's judgment against Babylon. And we know Daniel does. So <clears throat> my question is, which three prophets told details of the tyrannical, paganistic reign of Babylon, Babylonian rulers over the people of God? I should have said four because they all four did. Um, but So let's just change that word to four. What four prophets give us, thank you, you can turn that light on, which four prophets give us details about the Babylonian rule over the people of God? Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the major, major prophet that tells us about Babylon, Babylon and, and how it destroyed Jerusalem. It destroyed the temple. They plundered Jerusalem. Jeremiah is very, very detailed about that. And, uh, and then Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel tells us all about it. When the young people of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hebrew children in Babylon, God said that you will have no other gods before me. And Nebuchadnezzar builds a, tower, a statue and says, Worship me. What they say? We will not. Nebuchadnezzar says, and I will kill you. And they said, well, our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship that idol. They stood strong. Babylon was the first um, nation to actually, that we know of, persecute people for their worship of another God that they didn't believe in and uh, setting themselves up as the God to worship. So those three prophets are Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and, and then Isaiah. Isaiah talks a lot about it, so I should have had that on there too. In fact, Isaiah, and I don't remember the two chapters, uh, has two chapters about the uh, Babylon judgment as well as Jeremiah does. Okay, so let's see. Page 73, number 3, Genesis 11 and 12, God called the patriarch whom? Abraham, Abraham to leave Ur of Chaldees or Babylon. <laughs> Who were the prophets that related details? Yeah. Isaiah, Isaiah <laughs> Jeremiah, Daniel. Daniel, and Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Yes. All right. Now. What did the Jews, now we're going to get back to, to Zechariah, okay? Now that you know the history of Babylon, we are to think of it as a, a nation who hated God. And so when we read about Babylon anywhere, you will always find it that it is enmity against God. It is hate, rebellion against God. So now we are back from Babylon. The Jews have come back from Babylon and they are in, back in Jerusalem, and, they, and God gives Zechariah this vision of wickedness being taken back in a basket. Wickedness is represented by a woman, and she's being taken back to Babylon. Now, what was it? And God said, this basket's full of wickedness, and it's going to go back to Babylon. I don't want it here in our country. What was in that basket? What was so wicked? Well, the scriptures are going to show us that that basket represents commercialism and uh, commercialization. So I want to show you, in fact, the scriptures kind of refer to it or kind of express it as a virus that just came into the nation of Judah and just infected everybody. This virus of commercialization. Look, please, at Jeremiah 
chapter 29. When the people of um, Israel, Jerusalem, were taken captive to Babylon, Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem, and he was God's prophet at that time. And he wrote a letter to the people in Babylon. Now this is when, this, there were three times, three different invasions of Jerusalem. This was the first one. This is in 605 BC when uh, Daniel was taken into captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken into captivity and taken to Babylon. And they were living in the king's palace. And so Jeremiah is back home in Jerusalem, and he wrote them a letter. And we all know Jeremiah because it is Jeremiah 29 because it's the verse that we all um, quote when God says, I have plans for you. I have great plans for you. I have plans to prosper you. That's there. That's in that letter that Jeremiah wrote to the people in Babylon. And don't you know, when they received this letter, they were so happy. I want to read to you what Jeremiah told them. He said in verse 29 of Jeremiah, make sure you're up there because you've got to read this. Verse 1, this is the text of the letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and the priests and the prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile. I think he took 70,000 at that time. That may be too many. I can't remember. A whole lot, thousands, into Babylon. And so he wrote this letter. And so look at, ver at verse uh, 5. He said to them, while you are in Babylon, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Verse 6. Get married, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Verse 7, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. He's telling them to pray for Babylon. Because if Babylon prospers, you will prosper. And he says, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Don't let anybody discourage you. And then he says, verse 10, this is the second time he said it. When 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to you, bring you back to this place. So he said, you're going to be there how long? 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. I have plans, verse 11, for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Wasn't that a wonderful letter that he sent to them in the worst time of their national lives? They are in bondage and back in exile. And God said, I will bring you home. But until then... Learn the businesses. Become prosperous. Well, they did. And when they got home, they brought a lot of wealth back with them. And so, uh, let's see. Here's what Babylon looks like. Lights. <laughs> Babylon was a beautiful, beautiful city. It was a rich, rich city. In fact, today you can go into that area and you can find some of the brick that Nebuchadnezzar had built and he covered all of his walls with this beautiful brick and uh, it was, this, is, this is a processional way, very popular and this is the beautiful gate of Ishtar. Write that down in your notes to look up on your uh, research to look up the gate of Ishtar. It's beautiful. These walls were 300 feet tall from the top all the way down into the, into the river, way down deep. 300 foot tall, 30 feet wide. Nobody could get in there, could not get into Babylon by attacking it. And so he said to go there and live there. And they lived out somewhere, out by a canal somewhere out there. 
All right. So they, what did they bring back from Babylon? They brought back a virus caused by commercial success and vast wealth. And I'd like for us to look at this verse because this is a verse that we all hear and we need to remember this verse. And it's easy to misquote. You can turn the lights on. It's easy to misquote because it says, let's see if I'm going to say it correctly and you help me. Uh, money is the root of all evil. Is that right? Oh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what causes us to break that 10th commandment, to covet the love of money. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Look what happens when people eager for money. What happens to them? If you love money, you're eager for money, and you put it above everything, it's more important than coming to church. It's more important than taking care of your family. It's more important than your own health, isn't it? Love of money. This is what can happen. Well, you will wander from the faith. Oh, and you will pierce yourselves with many, many griefs. You will not find a lot of happy, fulfilled, rich people. They have pierced themselves with grief because it took everything they had to get that. It took their family. It took their spouse. It took their health. It took their peace of mind. It took everything. And they pierced themselves with many griefs. So that's 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. The woman, wickedness, represents the symptoms of the virus. They put all that wickedness in that basket and they took it back from whence it came, back to Babylon. She represented that. And so let's see what they are. Mainly, social injustices. And I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to get next week to Revelation 17 and 18. But I want to show you what God thinks about social injustice. What is social injustice? Because that was what was happening in Israel when they had too much wealth. It's not the money. It was the love of the money. So let's first of all go to Isaiah chapter 29. I want to read this verse to you. Isaiah, Jeremiah. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. I think I have them written up here, but please write these verses down. They're in your notes. And go back and read these verses. We need to look at ourselves and at our nation and see if we are doing any of these things. These injustices were denounced by the prophets. Isaiah says that you are denying justice in the courts, especially to the poor. Here's what he says. Those who with a word make someone out to be guilty. Ooh who ensnare the defender in court and with false testimony deprive the innocent of justice. This is what we call social injustice. Do we see any of that happening in our, in our country? Yes. That we give just a word. Look what we did to Justice Kavanaugh with just a word, one word. And they destroyed, tried to destroy a man. Uh, with a word, they make statements out to be guilty. They ensnare the defender, and they, with false testimony, deprive the innocent of justice. Doug? It's going on right now, it's going on right now today. That's right. So, the just, they, uh, first one is that justice is denied in the courts. That's number one on uh, letter B. The denial of justice. Let me read this one to you. Jeremiah, that first one was Isaiah. Here's Jeremiah. He says there are good leaders and there are evil leaders. What's the difference? What does a good leader do and what does an evil leader do? He says, he, he's talking to the king. He said the good king, talking about Josiah, does, uh, defended the cause of the poor and needy. That's what a good leader does. You defend everybody 
and all went well with him. But now the new king, Jehoiakim, he says, you, in your eyes and your heart, your eyes and your heart are only on dishonest gain. We don't want leaders like that. That the only thing that they have their heart set on is dishonest gain. Or on shedding innocent blood. Or on oppression and extortion. That is not the kind of leader we want. We want good leaders who... Uh, defend the cause of the poor and needy. We do not put anything above God because it begins. we begin to look like this. So that's number two, that Jeremiah contrasts good and evil leaders. Is that okay? Everybody know where I'm going with this? Number three, Amos. Amos was a minor prophet. And he said in Amos 5, you levy straw taxes on the poor. In fact, the poorest of the poor could only find the straw in the field. And he said, you're levying a tax on that. I don't think we do that so much in our country. I don't know. And impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, he says to the rich, you have built stone mansions. You'll not live in them. He said, you have planted lush vineyards. and You'll not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. What God is saying, I see. I see what happens when leaders cause social injustice. I see your sins. And then he says, see if you recognize this. He said, let justice roll on like a river. Let righteousness like a never failing stream. Let righteousness and justice roll on like a river. Ever heard that statement? Who's heard that? Except from reading in the Bible. Okay, let me show you. Um, that was paraphrased by Martin Luther King. Oh, I need the lights on this one. And Martin Luther, they said, they gave this phrase to Martin Luther. They did not give it to Amos. It really kind of bothered me. But Martin Luther in his sermon said, let justice can't read it. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. This is a, monu a memorial in uh, Alabama, uh, where, Birmingham, I think, where he says, let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. I've got a video of him saying that. It's just beautifully... He said it beautifully. So that was paraphrased by Martin Luther. So in your notes, thank you, uh, it says, Amos 5, God's people are to let what? Justice, Justice roll on like a what? River. river. And righteousness like a never failing stream. That's what you and I should be doing as individuals. Everything we do should be just. It should be righteous. Amos 8, same Amos says that God doesn't approve, nor does he for forget hypocrisy. He says, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor, saying, now look at the hypocrisy here. This is what the rich say. When will the new moon be over so that we can sell grain? That was a holiday. They couldn't sell anything on this holiday. When is it going to be over? When will this end? When will the Sabbath be ended so that we can market our wheat? Skimping, this is what they do now. They skimp on the measure. They put a little bit of sand in the bottom of the basket. They boost the price. They cheat with dishonest scales. They buy the poor with silver. If you can't pay, they buy them and make them slaves. And they buy the needy for a pair of sandals. If a needy person could not pay their uh, debt, they say, well, well, I'll just take your shoes then. And they sell even the sweepings with the wheat, the, the part of the wheat that couldn't be eaten, the chaff. They sold that as part of the wheat. God does not like this. This is what God is calling Babylon. When we oppress or when we hurt, 
or when we enjoy our luxuries at the expense of the poor and the needy. And I hope that we don't do that. I think as a nation, I think we are probably, God's pretty proud of us. Really, I do. Because, because of what Jesus Christ has done, he's changed the whole spectrum of the world. And we as Christians, I don't think we do this very much, but God wants Babylon to know that this, he doesn't like this. All right, so that's Amos 8. And the Lord has sworn by himself, I will never forget anything they have done. Why am I telling you this today? Because this is what God hates. This is what he's taking back to Babylon. This is what he will judge when he judges Babylon. And then I will, Micah 9, Micah 3, God requires justice and honesty from the civil leaders and the religious leaders. So you can read that this week too. I think when God told Abraham, I will bless the world through you, when we look at what Paul taught about a nation and about our faith, that we, we have done more, I think, for women in our nation because we are a Christian nation or were. We have done more for women than any other civilization. We have done more for the poor and more for the world's poor than any other nation, and God has blessed us for that. He has blessed us abundantly, and I am so thankful that I could be in a nation that doesn't do these kinds of things. And if it does, we need to hold our leaders accountable. God does not like that. And we've got to go because there are people out there. Let's pray real quickly. Father, I pray that we will make sure that our leaders are just, that they are honest, that they are people of integrity, that we will not coerce, we will not oppress, and Lord, thank you that you have given us a way in our nation through our Constitution and through the Bible that we can take care of our poor and needy. May we recognize how wonderful that is. May we be involved in it. Thank you for our church that we recognize the needy and the oppressed and we do so much to help them. Let us not put anything above you, Lord. Help us not to be commercially minded. Let us not love our money to the point that we pierce ourselves with many griefs. And we pray for those who do, Father, that you will soften their hearts toward you. We pray for our children who are learning about um, the scriptures, that they will, their hearts will be softened to accept your truths. And Lord, next week as we study Babylon and Revelation, I pray, Lord, that that it will come alive to people and we will recognize the times in which we're living. I pray for each person here today, Father. And thank you, Lord, for letting me be a teacher. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher.